Okay, so Ken will continue with this uh, series of lectures. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so my plan for the remaining two lectures is uh, today I'll discuss six dimensional superconformal field theories, and then tomorrow I'll discuss five dimensional theories. And um, so yesterday I was discussing two zero theories. Uh, so just, just as a reminder, if we have, for instance, N M5s, then we get a, a two zero. 60 superconformal field theory. Uh, this is a n minus one. Plus a decoupled tensor multiplet, which is the overall translational mode. And so, so today I wanted to, dis to discuss one zero theories. And so one way to get one zero theories along these lines is um, to combine M5 brains with M9 brains. So I just wanted to mention a little bit about what's, what these M9 brains are. So um, the E8, E8 heterotic string theory, uh, it was shown in, in the 1990s by Herjav and Witten that this is dual to M theory on an interval. So the interval is sometimes written as S1 mod Z2. It's a circle you mod out by this reflection and you just get an interval with two endpoints. And so this is, this is like the extra dimension, the 11th dimension, which from the point of view of, of the heterotic string is related to the coupling constant of, of the string theory. So there's an interval with two ends, and, and those ends, uh, well, I, some people call it the end of the world brain, but I usually just call it the M9 brain. And um, each of these M9 brains has an E8 gauge theory on it. So the heterotic string has an E8 and E8 gauge theory. And um, actually, when I was an undergraduate, I heard about the string theory revolution that came from a paper that Green and Schwartz wrote, where uh, they showed anomaly cancellation in 10 dimensions for these two special groups, SO32 and, and E8 times E8. And um, in 10 dimensions, you know, in, six, in four dimensions, the anomaly is a triangle diagram in 10 dimensions, it's a hexagon diagram. I'm mentioning some of this because I'll be discussing anomalies in six dimensions. And so this is like some warm up for things I wanted to mention a little bit in a little bit. But so for these two special groups, SO32 and E8 times E8, um, these are the gauge groups. The anomalies can be canceled by the Green Schwartz mechanism. And so, um, what Horjava and Witten showed was that not only could you cancel the anomalies. Uh, for E8 times E8, but you can do it locally at, at each one of these walls. So one of the E8s lives on one wall, and the other E8 lives on the other wall. Um, so, so some, for instance, if some person were living on this brain, then they would have an E8 gauge theory, and the other E8 gauge theory would be, so, wouldn't act on them, it would be somewhere else. Now the idea is to get uh, one zero theories is that, um, it, and by the way, this putting the theory on the interval breaks half of the supersymmetries. So um, M theory on a circle gives type 2A string theory, which has 32 supersymmetries. This E8 times E8 theory has minimal supersymmetry in 10 dimensions. So this has 16 SUSIs. So half of the SUSIs go away because of this Z2 orbifold. Um, now, what we can do is we can combine that with the M5 brains. So let's look at, for instance, we could put in one M5 brain. One M5 brain by itself is kind of a, has a, has a two zero, so living on the M5 brain, there's a two zero tensor multiplet. which uh, is the thing I was discussing yesterday. It has five scalars, which are the translations in the transverse mode, in the transverse direction, plus um, two-form gauge fields with self-dual three-form field strength. Uh, if we had a single M5 brain, that would just be a free theory, so it would be kind of a trivial thing. But even with a single M5 brain, if we bring it close to this M9 brain, we can get something interesting. So what happens is that there are M2 brains that connect them. 
And as we bring them together, these M2 brains, um, when they end on the M5 brain, it's a string. And when we bring them together, it looks like that string becomes tensionless. And it's not really literally a tensionless string theory, but it's um, actually a sign that there's an interacting superconformal field theory there. And so when, when the M5 is, is on top of the M9 brain, there's an interacting superconformal field theory. So this is, this is a picture of what the moduli space of, of general 1-0 superconformal field theories look like. And this is an example of that. So there's a, um, we can have a tensor branch which is the six-dimensional analog of a Coulomb branch. And so uh, the, the Coulomb branch in five and lower dimensions is where um, some scalar gets a, some scalar in a vector multiplet gets an expectation value. Here, this, this is the scalar in the tensor multiplet. So, so this gets an expectation value. So this line here is, is the expectation value for that tensor multiplet. And then, there could be a Higgs branch, and this is where some hypermultiplets have expectation value. And then there's, there's something interesting that can happen at the origin of the moduli space. So this is like a vacuum manifold for these theories. And it corresponds to the fact that there's no, these, these are mutually BPS. There's no tension between these, and so we could freely move along. Uh, this thing could be wherever it wants, and that's like the boundary conditions in infinity. Uh-huh. You're effectively on the tensor branch of what? Yeah, so, so, so the, the question was um, about, yeah, thanks for the question. The, um, it w so, actually, um, so actually, we have a few options here. And so, um, so what I want to do is here, um, I'll consider a, a limit where we decouple gravity. And so we'll take M Planck to be very, very large. And one way to do this is just to consider the low energy theory. So we could consider energies much, much less than M Planck. So even if M Planck is some finite thing, really I just mean I want to go to low energies. But um, also I want to take M string to infinity. I don't have to. Um, in general, if, if M string, so, or we could have M, let's say we could have also M string equals finite. And finite M string leads to what's called the little string theory. I mentioned this last time also. So there's a little string version of the two zero theories, and there's also a little string version of the theory that I'm discussing right now. And, um, this M string finite means that this interval is, is a finite size. Like M string is, ends up being related to the size of this interval. Um, and so, so, so the question was, do I have to take this, this interval to be like infinite size because otherwise I'm talking about little strings. Actually, um, for, for what I'm saying, it doesn't really matter too much if I'm discussing little strings or or the field theory, because even if we're discussing the little string theory, if we go to the infrared limit, it becomes effectively like the, the two zero field theory. Like we could go to some limit far below the whatever M string is. So yeah, so, so I'm imagining really that this thing, that there's some distance size here, and that distance size actually sets some energy scale, and we're interested just in energies well below that energy scale. Yeah, thanks. Um, Okay, right, so, so basically in this context what happens is that this expectation value of phi is like the distance between the M5 and the M9 brain. So, so this is M9, M5 distance in 
in this extra dimension, which I'm going to call X10. And, um, and then we, we also, by the way, still have rotational symmetry in, so if we take the M5 brain to have space, to have world's volume coordinates X0, let's say up to X5, we also have rotational symmetry in um, X6, 7, 8, and 9. So that's four directions. So, um, so in this case, we also have an SO4 symmetry. in X, six, seven, eight, and nine. And, and this becomes an R symmetry from the point of view of the field theory. So this SO4, we could write it as SU2 left times SU2 right. And this SU2 right is going to become the R symmetry of, of the superconformal algebra. So this is the superconformal R symmetry of one zero. So one zero supersymmetry has an SU two R symmetry, and then um, this S SU two is from the point of view of one zero is just like a global symmetry. And there's another global symmetry which is E eight. So there's also an E8 global symmetry. And the, and the reason why this is a global symmetry is because from, from the point of view of the original theory, this was a gauge symmetry. It was a gauge symmetry in 10 dimensions. But from the point of view of the theory living on the brain, it ends up being a global symmetry because when we take this decoupling limit, uh, the gauge fields, the E8 gauge fields, basically decouple, and so they become like background fields, but they can still couple to some operators, so there still has to be a conserved current uh, in this world volume. And so, so there's an E8 global symmetry, um, yeah, and if we move along the tensor branch, if, if we're away from the origin on the tensor branch, the E8 degrees of freedom are all, all become massive, so the E8, are massive here. So we don't really notice the, um, the E8 symmetry unless we're, we're at the place where, where we have this E8, this unbroken E8 gauge symmetry. So if we're sitting there, we see some massless E8. Um, uh, basically, we, I, I shouldn't really say the word massless or massive, because it's just a conformal field theory with an E8 global symmetry. So, so there's a conformal field theory with some operators that, that are, have an E8 global symmetry at, at this point in the moduli space. Mm -hmm. Ah, the... Um, Right, so yeah, so, so the question was, um, yeah, yeah, thanks for that question. So, so um, if you, when you, what happens when you um, look at this, this theory, like th this theory um, was studied more by Duff and, um, and collaborators in Witten. And, and what they pointed out was that if you have the theory on a, on a finite size uh, X10, then you have to have um, you have to have 24 M5 brains, and there's some flux there's some flux condition which tells you that there has to be 24 M5 brains, and one and then you could arrange those 24 M5 brains in different ways. You could put like 12 of them on here and 12 of them on here, for instance, which is kind of like a balanced configuration. Um, here, because I'm interested in this decoupling limit where M Planck goes to infinity, I basically am going to, to drop that condition, that flux condition that tells you that there has to be 24 M5 brains. So I'm going to consider the possibility that there could be like one M5 brain or infinite M5 brains because of taking this limit where I decouple supergravity. 
if I didn't decouple supergravity, there would be um, like a, a supergravity related flux condition. Yeah, that forces ex exactly 24 M5s, but. Yeah, yeah, the, 20, the 24 actually, yeah, thanks. The 24 actually is, is uh, in the case of K3, yeah. Yeah, so, so actually I was mentioning first one M5 just to, but, but we could actually, maybe I'll just put in already, we could have N M5s. And so if we had N M5s, then instead of here having just one tensor multiplet, we would have N of these. So we, here we would have a, a Coulomb branch where there are N tensor multiplets. And, and I wanna consider the possibility of any N. Yeah, yeah. So the so the global symmetry, if the global symmetry here at the origin, is 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 the same in that case. If I were to, um, yeah, yeah, the global symmetry is, is the same. Yeah, because these these are rotations and directions transverse to those brains, and so it, it doesn't care about how many brains we have. Yeah. So. Uh, uh -huh. Right, so, so like here if we had multiple M5s, there would also be M2s that connect them. And so, so here, for instance, well, there would be a direction in the moduli space where I could bring, for instance, all of the M5s away from the M9 brain. And then at low energies, here we would have a two zero theory of the type that I was talking about yesterday. So, so in this case, if we had N of them, it would be a two zero A N minus one plus a tensor, plus a free tensor multiplet. That would be the theory living here. And then when we bring them close to the uh, end of the wall, we see that we get actually a one zero theory with this extra E8 global symmetry. The, um, yeah, the two zero theory by itself doesn't admit a, any global symmetries, in fact. There's no global current multiplet for two zero. It just has the R symmetry. And this um, SU2 times SU2, it sits inside of the R symmetry. This, this is a subgroup of the SO5R of two zero. So if we were to separate all of these brains, this SU2 times SU2 would become the SO5 R symmetry of two zero, but then um, there's a distinguished direction, which is this direction where somewhere there's an M9 brain. And when we hit that M9 brain, then we really see that it's, uh, it, it doesn't have rotation symmetry in all of those directions. It only has the SO4 rotation symmetry, but then it also picks up an E8 symmetry. Okay, and now um, what's this Higgs branch? The Higgs branch in this case, so in this particular case, what the Higgs branch is, is the moduli space of N E8 instantons. So what's, what's this moduli space? So if you look at, um, for instance, an SU2 instanton, if we have instanton number, number K, it has a moduli space which is 2K um, hypermultiplets. For instance, um, where, for instance, if we take K to be one, so just a, a single instanton for SU2, then, so a hypermultiplet is four real scalars. So for instance, for k equals one, we have two hypers. And one of those hypers is just the translation mode. So this is the one translation of the instanton 
in the transverse directions. So for instance, like when you write down an instance on solution in four dimensions, it's like a point in Euclidean space-time. There's a distinguished point in Euclidean space-time. And translations, so it has co-dimension four. So an instanton. In general, when I say instanton, I mean some object whose co-dimension is four. So in four space-time dimensions, it, it would be a point in Euclidean space-time. In 10 space-time dimensions, it's a six-dimensional thing. And this six-dimensional thing is, is actually related to, to this world volume theory on this M5 brains when they're on the M9 brain. That's this six-dimensional thing. So there are four transverse directions, and one of them gives one of the hypers. That's, that's the same as, um, as the translations in these directions that I'm calling, um, the, the directions that I was calling like x, six, seven, eight, and nine. Yeah, so, so the, like translations in this directions is one of the hypers. And then, and then the other hyper is um, the plus the size of the instanton. So the size of the instanton is a modulus and SU2 rotations. So there are three SU2 rotations, one size modulus, that gives four, and that's the other hypermultiplet. So this is what you would have for, for SU2. And then for general groups, if we have a general group G instanton, the moduli space is um, the dual Coxeter number of G times K. So this dual Coxeter number is some Casimir of in the adjoint. Sometimes it's written with a check. Dual Coxeter number, which for E8, this, um, this thing is 30. And so the moduli space of, um, of E8 instantons is this many hypers. And one of the hypers is the translation mode, one of the hypers is size and SU2 rotations, and then the rest are just some extra things because of how SU2 can be embedded in E8. And um, this, this moduli space is something that's kind of, uh, you know, mathematicians studied how to get these moduli spaces for different groups from a hyperkähler quotient construction, what they call hyperkähler quotient construction, which is basically exactly the equations that you write down in physics for a Higgs branch of a, of a theory with eight supercharges. And so this hype, many, uh, instanton moduli spaces for classical groups, I mean for, for groups like SUN or SON or SPN can be written like that. But the moduli space of E8 instantons is something much more complicated and it doesn't have a, a nice hyperkähler quotient construction known to mathematicians as far as I know. But um, this, this theory that we get at the origin, that's its Higgs branch. It's the moduli space of E8 instantons. Um, Okay, and, and that we just see because, in fact, this uh, M5 brain is, is exactly like what you get when you shrink the instanton to zero size. So the idea here is that um, if we move up in this direction, this is like the size of the instanton. So when the instanton is non-zero size, it's kind of stuck on the, on the M9 brain but then when it becomes zero size, it can move off in this extra direction, and that's the tensor branch. So, so that's, that's what these theories uh, with their moduli space looks like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so the analog of the size is, for instance, um, some expectation values on the Higgs branch. Like, just, just to give one example, let's, let's look at the case where K is one. So then, then the, this Higgs branch has 30, 30 hypermultiplets. 
and these 30 hypermultiplets is one plus 29, uh, and this, this one is the translation mode. Actually, maybe I'll write it as one plus one plus 28. So one is the translation mode, one is like in the SU2, the size and SU2 rotations. Actually, E8 symmetry kind of is gonna rotate all of these, but if, I'm, if I move along this branch, I break the E8 symmetry. So um, E8, if, if the instanton has finite size, E8 is broken to some commutant of an SU2 in that E8. And so for, if the instanton is finite size, E8 is broken to some subgroup, and the biggest possible subgroup would be E7. So that, that could be like the commutant of SU2 in E8. And so, like for instance, this 28 is like one of the representations of E7 is 56. So this is like a half of 56. This is some matter multiple charged under E7. So, so basically like it's one of these moduli we can understand as being like the size of the instanton. And that, that measures how far up that's like this thing, how far up we are. Okay, uh, I think that's all I wanted to say about this particular example. Um, I'll, I'll come back to this example. Um, I'll, I'll come back to this example in a second when I talk about anomalies and, and things, but uh, I think that's all I wanted to say for the moment about these, these theories. Uh, maybe I should just give the, so I can, maybe I'll just give these theories a name. So I, I'll call these theories E8N, super conformal field theory. Or there's a little string variant. So the little string variant is if I hold M string finite, and then the superconformal field theory is if I look in the infrared limit. It kind of, con it, one thing that I think is a little uh, annoying is that many people refer to both of these theories as E string theories. So often you'll hear people say E string theory, and they don't, they're not making it clear whether they're talking about the conformal field theory or the little string variant. Uh, I think it's good to make the distinction between them. So, uh, so I'll just call I'll just call it this E8N. So, so this is some superconformal field theory with uh, that we get from N M5 brains on top of this M9 brain. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, so this is one way to get from from string theory to get a one zero theory. Um, other, uh, another thing we can do, which I won't really discuss because of lack of time, is um, we can also get one zero by combining brains, let, let's say type two brains, plus singularities. Like these A to E singularities that I mentioned last time. So last time I mentioned how we could put the theory on some, some um, transverse direction which is an, has an A to E singularity, or we can have brains, and if we put the two together then we get various one zero theories. And there are also ways, also, also there are many ways of getting one zero theories from F theory. And in fact, there are these papers of um, Bafna and Heckman and Filzotto and uh, Morrison and collaborators where they argue that every one zero theory can be obtained from F theory. But I, I won't discuss any, any of these other string constructions just for lack of time. 
Okay. Uh, yeah, so, so the next thing I wanted to talk about was I, I mentioned uh, in the last lecture that if we have a, a vector multiplet, so when I say vector multiplet, I mean gauge fields. When we have a vector multiplet, it's not conformal. Or D not equal to four. And the reason, the reason for that is that if we write down the Lagrangian is minus one over G squared, F mu nu, F mu nu. Then, so I mentioned last time, we see that, that this thing always has to have dimension two in any dimension because the gauge field is like a, something that makes covariant derivatives. And so it always has dimension one. And so F always has dimension two in any dimension. And so then we see that this thing has to have dimension, one over g squared has to have dimension uh, d minus d, d minus four. So only in four dimensions is it dimensionless. Um, okay, but actually this, the fact that, so in six dimensions, um, this is two. And the fact that it's two in six dimensions is interesting because two is also the dimension of a free scalar field in six dimensions. So in six dimensions, if we had a scalar field like d phi squared, then we would say that in order for this thing to, to have dimension six, phi has to have dimension two. And so, one way that we can make, make a theory that's conformal is instead of saying that there's a one over g squared, we can replace one over g squared with like the expectation value of some scalar, which has dimension two, and then, then it looks fine. We can make something that looks conformally invariant. So instead of having the usual thing, we'll say that we have a, a, a scalar field, so there's minus phi f mu nu, f mu nu, this is like a dilaton field. So often people introduce like some kind of field whose expectation value gives a coupling constant and that's called a dilaton. So we could introduce a dilaton and this, this thing could be conformal. We, we have to do some checks to see whether or not it's conformal but this, the Susie, it turns out that the SUSY version of this, I, I'm not sure if the non-SUSY version of this is conformal in six dimensions. But the, the SUSY version we believe is conformal. So the SUSY does in fact give super conformal field theories. And, and, and so then what can happen is, so in the SUSY version what we can do is we can make this phi, for instance, the scalar in a tensor multiplet. So it could be like this T in this picture. And then if, if T is non-zero, um, the expectation value of phi gives one over G squared. So if we're along this branch where the tensor multiplet has some expectation value, then we have a one over G squared that's non-zero, and then we would have a theory that's infrared free. So if we move along this tensor branch, we would have an infrared free uh, gauge field. But when we're at the origin, it's not really just an infrared free gauge theory anymore because it has this coupling to the tensor multiplet. Now, um, when we look at, so, so this is, this is uh, how you can make it super symmetric. You can't do it with a hyper multiplet. It, like it doesn't work with a hyper multiplet, but you can do it with the scalar of a tensor multiplet to make it super symmetric. But um, the scalar of a tensor multiplet also has the, the tensor multiplet in it. And so if you look at what this Lagrangian actually is, so maybe I'll write what the, what the SUSY version is. Um, so it has some coefficient that I'll call square root of C. This <coughs> square root of C is some coefficient. <coughs> Sorry. Um, and the reason why I'm gonna call it square root of C, I'll, I'll say in a second. So there's some coefficient square root of C and then there's uh, B wedge, F wedge, F. 
So the idea here is we can write the gauge field as a two form. If we write the gauge field as a two form, this, this thing could also be written as F wedge star F. So those are like the usual kinetic terms. <clears throat> and then this is like a topological term where we don't need the metric to write it down. So this B is the two form in the tensor multiplet. And this phi is its scalar partner. And then plus fermions. <coughs> okay, so, so if we want to write something super symmetric, that's what we would do. And um, one way to motivate this is um, if we were to go down to four dimensions, what would we get? So in four dimensions, B would, is a two form. We can dualize it to a compact scalar, some scalar field that lives on a circle. And this compact scalar that lives on a circle is what you would call an axion. And in fact, its coupling is what people call an axion. An axion is some field which couples to F wedge F. And if, if B gets an expectation value, well, in, if this axion has an expectation value, that's the theta angle. And so it's, it's not really, from that point of view, it's not surprising that if you have this term, Susie also wants you to have that term because we also know like in four dimensions, like in, in four dimensions, Supersymmetry tells you that the gauge coupling becomes a holomorphic object. It's, it's like theta over 2 pi plus 4 pi i over g squared. So it combines 1 over g squared with the theta angle. And here we have something similar because this is the dilettante whose expectation value gives 1 over g squared. And then this is some, two, some axion type field who, whose expectation value gives the theta angle. So, so Susie relates them. But in six dimensions, this term is interesting because in six dimensions, this, lead, this term is the same term that you write down in a 60 version of the Green-Schwartz mechanism. In fact, we could make this also non-abelian, like I could put in here trace and trace. And so this, this term in six dimensions, in, in six dimensions, I call it the Green-Schwartz West Segnati mechanism, because there was a, a paper by Green, Schwartz, and West that, that looked at this anomaly cancellation, then also a nice paper by Segnati that did a very general analysis of, of anomaly cancellation in six dimensions. So this is 6D cancellation. And so if, if we have this term here, uh, it's going to participate in anomaly cancellation. So that, that's actually the next thing I wanted to talk about is anomalies and anomaly cancellation. And the reason for this coefficient squared of C in here is because, in fact, this thing participates in anomaly cancellation in a way that's the square root of some coefficient in anomaly polynomial. Like this Green-Schwartz, Segnati west um, thing tells you that you could cancel anomalies that are perfect squares. And so you, if the anomaly is some perfect square, then you can cancel it. And this coefficient is the coefficient of that perfect square. And then you take a square root to do the anomaly cancellation. OK. Uh, any question? OK. I think I have a slide. Yeah. OK. Um, so this, this is some review about anomaly polynomials and in general dimensions. And I think if, if I had like another, another lecture, I would give a, a much more kind of pedagogical discussion about anomaly polynomials and things like that. But maybe people have already seen a lot of that anyway. Um, but if, if you haven't seen it, maybe I'll, this is some very quick thing. Basically. Uh, Anomalies are nicely encoded in D dimensions. Anomalies are nicely encoded in something that's a D plus two form. 
So normally if you're in D dimensions, the biggest thing you can make is a deform, but you can introduce some extra kind of fake coordinates to con so you go to two more dimensions. So like in four dimensions, we would go to six dimensions and we would write down a six form. And the fact that it's a six form in four dimensions is related to the fact that anomalies in four dimensions are triangle diagrams. And so at each one of these triangle, at each one of these vertices of the triangle diagram, we can have, for instance, a gauge field. And a gauge invariant description of this is to write instead of a gauge field in terms of its field strength. And so we have field strength, field strength, field strength. These field strengths are two forms. And so the triangle is associated with a six form that we get. In fact, this triangle is kind of completely symmetric under exchanging all of these, which is what we would get if we just looked at wedge products of two forms. And so the, ni the nice thing about this D plus two form is it's gauge invariant. Like it's built up only out of field strengths and it's completely topological. Which encodes the fact that anomalies are basically topological. And, um, and what it is is, it, it not only is it topological, but it has quantized coefficients. And the, the coefficients are quantized because it's related to things by uh, generalizations of the Atiyah Singer index theorem, like numbers of zero modes of Dirac operators in D plus two dimensions. And so these coefficients here count zero modes of operators, and so it has to have some coefficients that are appropriately quantized. And, So, okay, I, I'm not sure if I heard the question, but I, I, think, I, I think I heard the question. T tell me if this was the question. So, um, so, in four dimensions, we could talk about a few different kinds of anomalies. One is we can have gauge, gauge, gauge. And this thing, if we have three gauge fields, has to be zero. And so that's some, condition, that's some constraint on our matter content in four dimensions. And we could satisfy that, for instance, by having um, chiral fermions, but in conjugate representations. Or we can have it, like for, for SU5 gut, we can have it with like a five and a 10 bar. That's another way to satisfy this anomaly cancellation condition. So this, so this is some condition that the trace of the, the cube of the generator in the matter representations has to be zero. And this thing comes from saying that if we write down an anomaly polynomial in four dimensions, it has a term which is trace in the matter of, of this thing, of F cubed. And um, we have to satisfy that, that this thing has to be zero. The, the coefficient here has to be zero in order for the theory not to be sick. So that's, that's, that's a pure gauge anomaly. Another kind of anomaly that we could consider is like the original an anomaly that Adler, Bell, and Jakeef wrote down, the ABJ anomaly, where we have a global current and a gauge current and a gauge current and there's no reason why this has to be non-zero. It's often non-zero. And, and this tells us that d mu of j mu global is some coefficient times FF dual. And, and that's, that's perfectly fine. So, so this is, this I'll call the ABJ anomaly, where there's one global and two gauge symmetries. And then another kind of anomaly is the Etuft anomaly, where we have global, global,
And this, and this could also be non-zero. In fact, we love it when this is non-zero because that tells us something very non-trivial about the theory that has to match by this condition of Vitoff anomaly matching. So we're always very, if, if this thing is non-zero, we're happy. If this thing is non-zero, we don't really care that much. It just tells us that this global current actually isn't conserved after all. And if this thing is non-zero, then the theory, we just have to throw it in the garbage because we can't make sense of it. And, um, but all of these can be encoded in, uh, in this six form. So the idea is that we can think about these global currents. Normally, we, we think about this as, as putting the current at the vertex, J mu. But instead of putting the current at the vertex, what we can do is we can couple the current to a background field. So, th so this is a background field for the global current. And then we could put a background field strength here. And if we put the background field strength here, all of these anomalies from the point of view of the anomaly polynomial are in the same footing. So, so we just have to put in here every possible field strength, both gauge and global field strengths. And the one involving only the gauge fields has to be zero, otherwise we throw the theory away. And the ones involving like this thing can, can be non-zero. So, so I think the question was about this one. I'm not 100% sure if I got the question, but, but, but yeah, basically like the, the two extra dimensions are a trick. They're not, the, the two extra dimensions are fake. If, if the question is if the two extra dimensions are fake, yes, they're fake. It's a trick. Uh, maybe we can take this in discussion, it's probably better. Okay, okay, yeah, it's probably good for the discussion. Yeah, the, so these two extra dimensions are, are just a, a trick, and so the idea is that, um, we write this d plus two form as d of a d plus one form. So for instance, if the d plus two form were f wedge f, this, this is a four form. So this is something that we might do in two dimensions, or it might be part of something that we would write in four dimensions. Like for this abj case, we, we, part of the six form involves this anomaly for the gauge fields, and then the other part involves the global background current. And so what we can do, for instance, here is we can write this as D of this form. This is the Chern-Simons form. So, so this thing here, this thing with a zero, is like the analog, is a, is a Chern-Simons form, for instance. In, in general, this would be some kind of Chern-Simons form. And the zero here just means that it involves the gauge fields, but it doesn't involve the gauge variation parameter. So, so this thing here, like the Chern-Simons form, um, involves the gauge fields, yeah, okay, so it involves the gauge fields. Now, if we take the variation of this under a gauge transformation, we get something that's in general non-zero, like the variation of the Chern-Simons form is something that's non-zero, but it's a total derivative. And so the variation here is D of something else. And that fits with the, this fact here because if I take the variation of this thing, it's gauge invariant, and so we should get zero. And so if I hit this thing with another D, like the, the D is, is the D of, of computing forms, and this delta is the delta of gauge variation, those things commute with each other. And so if I hit this thing with another D, I should get zero, and I do because D squared is to zero. Anyway, now when I go down to one more, so I write this thing, this is like a one, one power of the gauge parameter. So in this case, we would get, for instance, like lambda f. So, so this is what you do in general, is that you compute this d plus two form, and then the variation of the effective action as a function of the background fields or the gauge fields can be written as this thing that you get at, at the end of this procedure. So you, you introduce two extra fake dimensions, and then in the end, you get something which involves the gauge parameter, and that's the gauge variation of of, of the effective action. 
but it's, it's, it's something that's nicest when you, go to, when you introduce these extra fake two dimensions because then you get something that's gauge invariant. And also when you go down to this, to this last step, you do various things that introduce ambiguities, which you know, there are always various ambiguities when you write down these anomalies, things that you can cancel with local counter terms. And all of that is kind of encoded in the fact that you're integrating something and those like local counter terms and all of that are like integration constants. But if you write it in terms of this d plus two form, it's very clean. Okay, so yeah, so, so this is what the anomaly polynomial looks like in general. There's a piece involving only the gauge fields that has to cancel that restricts the mattering content. There's a piece that involves only the global symmetries and also gravity, and these are the atuft anomalies. Then there's some other mixed terms. Uh, this is some, these mixed terms, I mentioned here a mixed term involving one global symmetry and two gauge symmetries. We can also consider the case, for instance, where we have um, one gauge symmetry and two global symmetries. And that's something which was the subject of a, of a recent paper that I wrote with Cordova and Dimitrescu. So I won't discuss it today, but these mixed anomalies are not actually anomalies. And there's some story that is kind of a long story that we discussed in our paper, recent paper, which was a long paper. Uh, but yeah, because of no time, I, I won't discuss it. Um, another example that I won't really discuss because of lack of time is the small SO32 instanton example. Here I mentioned before, like the small E8 instanton example. If we look at, there's an analog of that for the small SO32 instanton, which was written down in a paper by Witten in 1995. That theory has a global SO32 symmetry, just like this theory that I wrote down before had a global E8 symmetry. And um, it has some matter content that Witten wrote down. And if you write down the anomaly polynomial, you find that it's zero when all of the backgrounds are turned off. So this is a theory which is anomaly free. Um, so this theory exists in six dimensions and it's anomaly free. You don't you don't need anything like a green schwartz west signati mechanism to cancel its anomalies. Um, now the, the flip side of it being anomaly free is that it's a boring theory in the infrared. There's, this theory is, is just some infrared free theory which is like one one, super, one, one theories which can't be made super conformal. Um, but the little string version of this by the way is T dual to the E8 little string. Yeah, so, so the question was if the anomaly polynomial is unique. There's, um, yeah, in, it's, it's a property of the theory. And so there's a way in a given theory in principle that's it's something that we could calculate in the theory. So if the theory is a free theory, the way that to calculate it is to look at a paper by Alvarez, Gomez, and Witten where they wrote down uh, what the anomaly polynomial is for every free theory in every dimension. And so by writing, looking at that paper, we can write down the anomaly polynomial. If it's not a free theory, then, um, th then we have to work harder to write the anomaly polynomial. In fact, I think on the next slide, I, I wrote down some anomaly polynomials for these interacting theories. But yeah, in principle, there's a unique way to do it. Uh, I see my time is basically, do I have like a few minutes or is it up? Okay, I have Five a few minutes. minutes. Okay, so maybe since I've basically run out of time, I'll just flash some slides, since I have slides now, anyway. Um, so one, one nice thing about supersymmetry in lower dimensions is that you can relate the conformal anomaly A to the Atuft anomalies. And so we could try to do that also in six dimensions. So in six dimensions, the anomaly in six dimensions, this ID plus two becomes, eight, becomes I8. And so instead of having triangle diagrams, we have squared diagrams in six dimensions. So, so we have square diagrams with gauge fields at, at the edges of the square. So this is in 4D and this is in 6D. And so, so that's what this box represents, is the anomaly diagram that we can compute. And so this is something that can be computed. It's, um, and it has anomaly matching. And then um, the idea, an idea that 
that we studied some years ago was to relate this by supersymmetry to the conformal anomaly A. So I thought I would just briefly flash some slides about how that's related to the conformal anomaly A. Um, so in general, if we write down these one, zero, and hoofed anomalies, part of it involves just the, the SU2R symmetry and the, um, and, and the gravity piece. So this P1 of T is, is something that involves the curvature of, of the background metric, if we put the theory on a background metric. And that also enters, this P1 is, is the Pontryagin class, Pontryagin density. This is a four form. And this C2 is trace of F squared. The two is because it's F squared. And F is, is a two form, and so C2 is a four form, and then when you square it, you get an eight form. So, so one of the things that you can write, is, which is an eight form, is the second churn class of the R symmetry squared. It has some coefficient alpha that depends on the theory. Um, and then these are some other terms that, that you can write down that for the background fields. So basically, these alpha, beta, gamma, delta are properties of the theory that we could call a Tuft anomalies. And this can be computed for many one zero super conformal field theories. There was a, a nice paper by this group which computes these quantities, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, for many theories. Like for instance, for the e, small E8 instanton theories, these coefficients alpha, beta, gamma, delta take these values. So here, for instance, you see like this n cubed behavior. As in the two zero theory, there's this n cubed behavior. So this is like a leading thing that you could also get also from um, large n arguments. So in the large n limit, you could try to get, you could get the coefficient of this n cubed. All of these subleading pieces are things that you don't see in a nice way from large n, but there's a way to compute it using um, a variant of, of a calculation that was done by Harvey, Manazin, and Moore, where they computed uh, for the two zero theory of type AN, they computed that the anomaly wasn't just N cubed, some coefficient in the anomaly piece wasn't just N cubed, but it was N cubed minus N. And they got the minus N by using M theory and, and some argument with anomaly inflow. So given the time, I, I, I planned actually to, I have notes where I was, I think, by the way, I, I'll make these notes somehow available. But, so I have notes where I was planning to go through some of this, but I'm just now like rushing because of lack of time. Um, yeah, so, so those, these are all exact information about this theory. So the, the nice thing about Etuft anomalies is that you can also often compute them exactly by some tricks, like anomaly inflow. So the fact that this has like all of these subleading in large n things is some interesting information about these theories. Um, and there's a way to, to so, so this thing in the box is a result that, that we obtained with, uh, in a paper with uh, Cordova and Dimitrescu a couple of years ago, where we related the conformal anomaly A to these alpha, beta, gamma coefficients of the Etuft anomalies. And a key, a key thing that allowed us to do this was a nice paper written by a group here at Trieste. I mean, the, if you look at the authors of this paper, it came from Trieste. It was by Bergschaff, Salam, and Sesgin in 86. And they were looking at some six-dimensional supergravity with some R-squared terms. And so they supersymmetrized the R-squared terms. And, and that's exactly what we needed in order, um, like we were able to, to look at their results and the supersymmetric, supersymmetrization of the R squared terms and infer how to relate the conformal anomaly A to these Etuft anomalies. And so this is some general result that it, if you know the Etuft anomalies, you can plug it into this formula to get the conformal anomaly A. Like for instance, for this theory of of the n small e8 instantons, this is the conformal anomaly A. And this is an exact result because the, exact, the anomalies were exactly computed by, by this group. And then this is an exact formula following from supersymmetry. And so you get the exact conformal anomaly A. And I think for lack of time, I should basically just stop. But um, yeah, maybe, maybe I'll just make these slides available if people have questions. I can, 
I could continue next time, but I think next time I, since the title of the, these lectures were 5D and 6D, and I haven't discussed 5D yet, I think I'll spend all of next time on 5D and just, um, just end here for 6D. <laughs>